liquefied natural gas. That's all the buzz these days. There are going to be, we're told, three plants going in. I don't know whether it's Prince Herbert or Kitimat. They seem to change their mind. In any event, up until this last week or so, we're now talking around the last couple of weeks in June, if you're watching it a little later than that, up until a week or so ago, the provincial government made it abundantly clear that never, 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 ever, cross our heart, hope to die, do we want to use fossil fuels to make energy for, uh, again. And that's one of the reasons that they gave for the private power. They have to bring that in instead of uh, uh, having to, to use uh, uh, fossil fuels. Now, we have the premier of the province saying to the LNG people, oh, whoopsie daisy, all of a sudden, the natural gas we're gonna let you use is green power. Now, so you've got now green natural gas, fly at her. Now, nobody else can come along and do this. And you don't have to buy from BC Hydro. You can use your own natural gas to make your own power. Having some experience in the world of politics, um, you're not totally surprised by the twists and turns that might come from a, a premier like uh, Premier Clark, are you? <laughs> no, Eric, but I'll tell you, I'm shocked to hear what I've been hearing and to hear the appalling excuses that are given. Usually politicians come up with something that at least has a, a degree of credibility. But for the governor of British Columbia to suddenly change natural gas from being black as the ace of spades into green that in order to help the LNG industry makes me ask an awful lot of questions, not the least of which is what the, the LNG companies got on the government. That's, that's a, a valid remark about the inconsistencies, <laughs> I agree. But um, I think what is, a, what is more relevant in this discussion is the fact that these industrial customers or wannabe customers or thought to be customers that Warren Bell is wooing and, and trying to bring into the fold as, as a business development director, they're, um, they're highly, highly uh, speculative. If you, if you go back in history, like in the, in the 80s, and there was a period when BC Hydro was looking at uh, an armload of new customers, industrial customers. Everybody thought this was the greatest thing. By the time the dust settled, that is to say the commodity boom was off and things started to roll back, like coal and uh, Tumblr Ridge, there was only maybe 40% of them left on the ground. And the rest have disappeared. They're fickle. And they have to be because they're they're going to do business in a world of huge volatility for their product, the commodity. Once we get in to doing business with those folks, like we are talking about doing, we are going into a whole different risk profile with a public asset, and we, the public knows nothing about this. They would never accept this risk profile if they were given the opportunity to understand it. And the politicians don't understand it, really, in my view. Am I right in saying, Eric, that the way things are going now, to predict the price of natural gas five minutes from now, let alone five years from now, is very, very difficult. All of this fracking gas we've hearing so much is coming on stream. How much of it's coming, we don't really know. We don't know where it's all coming from, et cetera. So if you're going into the natural gas business, uh, liquefied or otherwise, you're in a pretty big gambling situation, particularly if you put up a lot of capital cost to build your plants. Yeah. Um, to sort of bring in a military uh, term, situational awareness is, the, is a characterization of a commander that knows the art more than a pedestrian commander, one who, who just simply follows a code book and so yeah. on. Uh, march here, march there, and two, four, you know, yeah. two miles down the road you'll meet this and then you'll do that. Forget that. A real good commander has situational awareness. He's successful. In the case of British Columbia and its government, and in the case of BC Hydro, the situational awareness moment was in 2008 the world took a step back, and it wasn't just a small step. One of the leading indicators that has never been gained, to my knowledge, is an indicator called the Baltic Dry Cargo Exchange. That number fell from over 12,000 to about 1,000 in a matter of about six months in 08. 
And since that time, it has bumped around like a dead cat bounce. You would get there, sure. But it's still stuck around a thousand. That tells anybody who's got anything between the eyes that's working that the world has taken a time out for international trade. And here we are, we're the folks who like to produce, shame on us, all the stuff that goes in as primary products to the economic system globally. And we haven't figured out that there isn't going to be buyers for this stuff. We are still pretending that the world is going to suddenly make a recovery in spite of everybody's financial difficulties, well publicized everywhere since 2008. We're still in a, in a dream world, a fictional, self-indulgent dream world. And so here we are planning to spend basically 30 or 35 billion dollars of new money, borrowed money, to create an electrical environment for people who are not going to be probably in business in about a year or two, let alone even there on the ground. The ghost towns. It's so, happened before. It seems to me, Eric, it's a lot like somebody opening up a fruit stand and uh, they know the price of all the things they've got on there, how much it costs them, etc. And they're uh, banking on the fact they're going to get uh, two times that or whatever it may be from people in cars. And yet the fact remains, if you look at the people in cars, everybody's poor these days, they've got gas to get places, et cetera, and they'd be lucky to get one-tenth of what they put up the price. So it seems to me it's that kind of a gamble, isn't it? When you're going into the LNG or any other part of the natural gas business, you're gambling that the price of bananas and so on is not going to be nearly as high as you thought it was. Well, resource extraction is a mugs game to bet on, and we're betting big. Now, the price of I think today the price of uh, quoted price of uh, crude went below eighty dollars. I mean, I was around. You were around when gas talk and oil talk in Alberta in the eighties and seventies was absolutely astronomical, and they even printed bumper stickers afterwards that said, "Please God." Don't let me forget this moment. Yeah. And when it happens again, yeah. let me keep some of my money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's right. You know, in the National Energy Program, that got the Liberals in so much trouble. I think uh, the price of oil at that time was something like twenty-eight or something dollars a barrel. Yeah. Well, if 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 we've got a uh, a slide in commodity prices underway, which seems to be uh, a, a suggestion there. I mean, we already have the early indication of the uh, dry cargo index. Yeah. We, we know that real estate in North America has been overpriced based on the various indexes that can, you can refer to. They're public. Uh, we know we've, we've been printing money and credit recklessly, so that has to all be bled out of the system before it can stabilize. This is stuff you're supposed to know about and think about when you're making plans to make billions of dollars of investment. Otherwise, you get landed with a stranded, non-productive asset, but you still have to pay the bill. I remember some years ago talking to the chief economist for the BC Credit Unions, I've forgotten his name offhand, Richard, I can't remember his last name. I'm sorry, Richard, if you're watching this, but he was talking about oil at that time that was around 70 or $80 a barrel, et cetera and predicting that th these certain things would happen. As long as it stays around there, this would happen, that would happen, and so on and so forth. And I asked him, what if it goes over $100? He said, all bets are off. Well, if all bets are off, it seems to me this is a lousy time to be getting into a speculative into, business. And to be, be being a big better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You should take them off the table, not put them on the table, yeah. which is what our government's doing. What do we do, Eric? Uh, people who are watching this will be wondering what to do. And I, I've got to say this editorially, the NDP have, have disappointed me in the fact they haven't come to grips with these problems in any specific ways. By the time people see this, maybe they have, but they haven't at this point. What is the Anderson prescription for the disease we now have, or the many diseases we now have? Well, it's... Um it's obviously going to be pushing against a lot of pushback, that's for sure, whatever you do, because yeah. the vested interests that are the grifters that are as attached to this money pot, they aren't going to give up easy, so there's going to be a, an awful lot of blood on the, on the ground. But then, anytime anything big or anything meaningful happens, there's usually blood. So what, what else? You know, you got to sort of reckon that 
you got to spill some blood in this case, you know, get out the silver bullet. In the case of hydro, um, the immediate thing is they should shut down any new calls for new energy. That's private energy. Private energy, yeah, yeah. period. They uh, should take all of the, uh, the uh, industrial demand expectations off the table. And if there are to be things built to serve industrial customers, they should be built site specific and they should be for customers at full cost to produce. No subsidies from the public. Then, like uh, in my dream of dreams, it, it, we would start to look at the uh, existing contracts that are there for IPPs and un try and unwind them, try and renegotiate them. And this isn't anything unusual. I mean, if you talk to a natural gas guy from Alberta who's had some history in that industry, He'll tell you about having to renegotiate as a producer, yeah. renegotiate contracts with buyers in, in his uh, markets, especially in the States. If you talk to a coal guy who's got a memory from the 70s in British Columbia or 80s, he'll talk to you about how he had to negotiate and take lower prices because the Japanese said, well, we can't afford to pay you what we thought we could. One thing about, before we get on to another thing that I want to talk about, Site C, etc. Uh, one thing that kind of puzzles me about the NDP's position on these signed contracts, if these contracts are unconscionable, surely they should be open. And I liken it to a guy who runs for mayor to clean out the house and put a clean government in, in the city, gets elected. Now, he doesn't decide to keep the former mayor's brother-in-law's brother all his old contracts. He gets rid of them. Now, surely the NDP should at least be saying this. We will look at them, not just to see whether they're good business, but are they conscionable? Are they something that uh, any kind of people in good conscience should put onto the public? Well, I'm, I'm hoping they will. Yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd like to live with that. I'd like to go into the next election thinking that they will, in fact, stand firmly for the public interest. Yeah. In, and if these contracts that we speak of for the IPPs are done definitely against the con the public interest. Now, I know that's a broad yeah. term, but you know, we do have a public utilities commission and they do have a mandate to look after the public interest and they may, may well be the right place to go or the courts to settle the issue. Is is it is this contract something reasonable? And if it isn't, then maybe it sh maybe we should start putting blood on the floor. That should be it. There's uh, one other thing I want to raise before we go to Site C, Eric. I, I don't like to raise this because I'm an environmentalist and I think the environmental arguments are against all these projects, pipelines, tankers, and all the rest of it. But looking at the broad range of the things we've been talking about today and tankers and pipelines, I don't see anything in it for British Columbia. The employment it brings is minuscule, uh, it, mostly it's menial. Uh, left over in most of these cases are, are a few computer experts, etc. I don't see any great dollops of money dropping on our lap or, or, or huge uh, numbers of people suddenly being employed at all. So I guess I have to ask this question against my, my will as an environmentalist. Why are we doing this? Um, oh. I think I'm. I think I'm being asked the wrong. I'm the wrong person you asked that question of. I think you should be asking the question of Premier Clark. Is there a benefit that you, as an economist, can see that's worth all the, worth the candle here? No. We are pauperizing ourselves and not realizing we're doing it. And to me, that trumps any discussion. What was needed was the right question. <laughs> Let's go to Site C, and, and I go back long enough to have had that an argument when I was in government back in the, in the late 70s, and I don't profess to know much about it except that it is very controversial. What about it? Is it, is it? Are there circumstances in which we should be building Site C, and are we in those circumstances? Uh, no, uh, we shouldn't be building Site C, mostly because um, and I get this information from a former civil engineer who did work on Site C in the era that you're talking about, I guess in the 80s. 
um, very familiar with the project, very familiar with the circumstances of, of the structure of the land around it. To me, it's a, it's a, it's a poor choice of location simply because it's ground that's very fragile. I mean, you could have slumps into the dam if you built one. You could have slumps that would remove 50% of the storage capacity in a very short time. It would silt up and, and the sides would break down and you'd be then left with half your productive capacity on a totally wrong financial footing. Your financial footing would be based on something that maybe would not there. It's too big a risk on a financial footing, forgetting about the environment, which is another issue altogether, and it's a big one. So no, I, I think Site C is a, is, a, is a loser of a deal, a loser of an idea. And we don't need it. I mean, this province has proven, if you go back into the numbers, has proven itself capable of learning about conservation. We have actually reduced our consumption per capita. I grant it slowly, but it's happening. We should be, we should be thinking joyous things about that achievement and doing more of it. Not saying, oh, well, you know, we're gonna get a whole bunch more people, which nobody seems to know where they're gonna come from, and suddenly we're gonna be needing all this new energy from somewhere. We should be focusing more on what we can save and, uh, and it's there to be saved. You know, if it drives me nuts, it must do the same to you when the government come back, which comes back, particularly local MLAs who've got nothing much to do anyway, and say, oh, look, if we're gonna have these big new television screens and all these computers and all the rest of it, we gotta have more power, gotta have Site C, and besides that, uh, BC is a net importer of, of power. I mean, uh, uh, it's a bunch of rubbish, but it's, it's certainly got an appeal to somebody who doesn't want to think more than 10 seconds about it, but it is rubbish. Well, the evidence, this is where we go back to what John and Mark did. They provided us with evidence, and I can provide similar evidence in stuff that I've dug out, that this kind of talk is only guessing. It's nothing to do with reality. Let's have a conversation based on evidence, an evidence-based conversation, not one of about wishful thinking and fantasy which is what seems to prevail in some places these days. On Site C, Eric, the Premier has made some interesting statements lately about what Site C power is necessary for, uh, such as LNG plants, which are privately owned, and I suppose such as fracking and that sort of thing. Is, it, is that sort of commercial activity on the come sufficient to build a project the size of Site C? No, no it's not. We can achieve some accommodation for new business through reprogramming some of our existing legacy assets that have been downsized due to the introduction of new independent power production uh, electricity. The, the independent power producers have supplanted existing and former production to the tune of about 10 to 14 thousand units of electricity which is which is like 25 percent of of what we're now consuming in the province well there's got to be somewhere in that large number available capacity from the legacy dams that have been suppressed and shut down to accommodate the new power that's been brought on stream by these other contracts so we have a built-in bungee feature to our uh, ability to produce and deliver if it is needed. So you don't have to, I don't think you have to add a Site C to the mix. In fact, given the price of natural gas and the abundance of it, maybe that should be something where new generation would be brought on stream uh, closer to where consumption is needed. So you don't have to build these huge, long power line structures that goes from a, a fixed asset, such as a, a, a Site C dam. Um, you can run a pipeline to a, a, a big industrial customer and, and feed them a natural gas energy, which we are currently in abundance and, and prospected to have a lot 
around for a long time. Let's use some of that opportunity. Well, we haven't touched the question of downstream benefits of the Columbia River Treaty also. We've no. got power available to us there if, if we need it. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, whatever happened to the day when industrial, the industrialists took a chance, took a risk, didn't have everything all tied up for them nice, and nicely in a bow? Well, if you, if you scratch an industrialist or, a, or a, a venture capitalist, underneath you'll find they bleed the same way as everyone else. They want a monopoly. Yeah. And if they can get a public monopoly, that's even the best. Yeah. So, you know, that's what they're after. That's what they lust for. Yeah. That's what their shareholders lust for. They want certainty of lots of income. Would it be fair to leave this conversation uh, along this line, Eric? If we don't change our tune, if we don't start taking care of our resources, we don't uh, deal more with things like conservation uh, and uh, deal much more with uh, putting BC Hydro back on its feet so it could be what it was. If we don't start doing that pretty soon, we're in one hell of a lot of trouble. Yeah, we're, we're servants. We're back into a role of servants. Not, we're not masters in our own house, no. We've lost our sovereignty as individuals and as a province and a country. Thank <laughs> you.